Finest Hour, The Battle of Britain, was made possible by contributions to your PBS stations from viewers like you. Thank you. In 1940, the United States was inward-looking and poorly prepared for war. As Adolf Hitler's armies swept forward, only Great Britain stood between him and the complete enslavement of Europe. But could the British people stand up to the Nazi onslaught? When you saw the offensive coming through Europe like a knife through butter, you realized that you were up against an army the world had never seen the likes of before. Well, I remember my father saying, this is the most terrible time now. This is the time when we all have to be very careful. It brought all the brave ones to their knees and prayed. We went about rather numb for a while. We certainly felt in our hearts that we were going to be reduced to rubble. At Europe's moment of greatest peril, a generation of young men and women faced a daunting challenge. The fate of the world lay in their hands. You will hear the stories of the people who were there, the people in the front line. The one thing we were not going to do was to surrender. We were going to get back to our own troops somehow. We had to win the war and we were determined to do it, whatever happened. Everybody was going to fight right to the bitter end. Killed or be killed, in fact. They were killing us, and, and, and we had to kill them. In May 1940, the quiet countryside along the border of France and Germany was untouched by a war that had begun six months before in distant Poland. For all this time, French soldiers and their British allies had dug in and waited for Hitler to make his move. On the 10th of May, he did, with devastating effect. One of the British soldiers directly in the path of the attack was 20-year-old Ernie Leggett, a farm laborer's son from Norfolk who had joined the army to escape unemployment. We marched into the woods. We'd got hurricane lamps and our company commander got us together and then said, well, chaps, we're now at war. Of course, it struck a sort of an excitement in the, in the tummy. When you aim to shoot, well, aim your rifle to shoot, you will now shoot to kill. I was going to be in the front line and uh, meet the enemy face to face. I suddenly realized, good Lord, what, what have I done? Why did I join an infantry regiment? Will I be killed? Will I get back? To my home, will I see my parents again? What is going to happen? Hitler's armies stormed into Belgium, Holland, and France. His Blitzkrieg was a new kind of war. Fast-moving armored forces, supported by dense air cover, and it overwhelmed all initial resistance. On the same day, the 10th of May, the British government fell, and a new prime minister, 65-year-old Winston Churchill, stepped into the breach. Outside Downing Street, he received a rapturous welcome. But inside, many regarded him as a high-risk choice, a maverick. The staff at Number 10 had grave misgivings about this man. They'd heard rumors about how he was impossible to please, difficult to work for, that he was like a man used to giving orders, but unaware of the practicalities of uh, carrying them out. 
Many of those who were already serving under Churchill in Britain's Royal Navy had mixed feelings about him too. Churchill was already ruling our lives at any rate. He was the um, First Lord of the Admiralty, you know, so, and he was always a gung-ho sort of bastard, like, you know, get in and do this and do that. I mean, if you look back on his career, you know, as a soldier and that, he was a sort of boy's own paper type of man, wasn't he, you know? Fine leading a charge, like, he'd been all right in the charge of the Light Brigade or something like that. Churchill shocked fellow politicians by appointing himself Minister of Defence, taking daily control of Britain's war effort. Then, in his first speech as Prime Minister, he prepared his colleagues for the worst. I would say to the House, as I said to those who have joined the government, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears and sweat. Many MPs received the speech in anxious silence, especially those from Churchill's own Conservative Party. Within Churchill's new coalition cabinet, even senior ministers were concerned about his character. Foreign Secretary Lord Halifax, an old rival, called him a gangster and his appointment a tragedy. <laughs> From the moment he took office, Churchill's principal international objective was to bring the United States into the war, either as an ally or as a source of much needed economic and military aid. Churchill, half American himself, believed that President Franklin D. Roosevelt would move quickly to help save Britain. But a presidential election was just months away, and Roosevelt needed the votes of the majority of Americans who wanted no part in another foreign war. Despite what happens in continents overseas, the United States of America shall and must remain as long ago the father of our country prayed that it might remain unentangled and free. The president allowed the sale of some military equipment, but he did not give Britain anything like the aid its new prime minister was requesting. Northern Europe was in chaos. Holland succumbed to the Blitzkrieg in just four days. Refugees clogged these roads. From above, they were terrorized by dive bombers with sirens fitted to their wheels. Coming down, they made this really hideous screaming sound, a scream out of hell. It was the first time I was frightened. I was really frightened, and I just shook with terror. Couldn't help it. We could actually see the flight of the bombs coming down. And, uh, of course, as they hit the ground, there, there were men, women, children, horses going up in the air and uh, coming down again, totally mutilated. It was just devastating. And of course, the poor people had no last rites given to them. They had no one to bandage up their wounds. They just died. As the German attacks intensified, more British troops were caught up in the turmoil. One shocked soldier reported what he saw to his officer, Peter Vaux. He said, I was on my motorcycle doing a job for the colonel, and I was blown off my motorcycle. And I found myself beside a little boy of about five, and he'd had his legs blown off, and he was blinded in one eye, and he was in terrible pain. And I took him in my arms, and I could see he was dying. And I took out my revolver, and I shot him, sir. I did do right, didn't I, he said. I said, yes, you did do right. I would have done the same. At 
As a boy, Peter Vox loved maps and machines and dreamed of being a soldier. 23 years old, he was now a reconnaissance officer. As the German columns advanced deep into France and Belgium, it was Vox's job to look for them. That was a creepy experience, traveling through this empty countryside. Where are the Germans over the next hill, round the next corner? When Peter Vox finally spotted the Germans near the French-Belgium border, he was ordered to plot his regiment's route into battle. It was quite a responsibility for young Second Lieutenant Vox to be taking the whole regiment into battle with his map and his compass, and hoping to God he got it right. Churchill worked late into the night, trying to take command of every detail. One evening, 18-year-old secretary Marion Holmes was introduced to her new boss. This is Miss Holmes, uh, Mr. Churchill. This is Miss Holmes, Prime Minister. And Churchill was sitting in this deep armchair, absorbed in a document, completely absorbed. He didn't even look up or answer. And then, without any warning, he started to dictate. And so I typed away. And bear in mind, it was not easy to hear Churchill, because often he'd abandoned his dentures. <laughs> he had a slight speech impediment, and he might, at that moment, be smoking a cigar. So I typed away, and he said, give me. See, and I, I just took the minute or directive, whatever it was, over to him, and went for the door. And there was this explosion behind me. Where are you going? I've hardly started. And then he looked up and I looked. I was transfixed, wide-eyed and transfixed. And then he said, with a whole face, that fantastic face, cherubic face, changed to this marvellous smile. He said, oh, I'm so sorry. What was your name? And I said, Miss Holmes. And we sit down. And then he kept looking at me over his glasses, you see. And he said, you must never be frightened of me when I snap. I'm not thinking of you, I'm thinking of the work. As he learnt more about Britain's military weakness, Churchill's cables to Washington became ever more demanding. But Roosevelt's evasive answers generated frustration inside Downing Street. Washington's man in London was Ambassador Joseph Kennedy, father of future President John F. Kennedy. He was sending Roosevelt a stream of messages predicting a quick victory for Hitler. Kennedy was an isolationist who believed that America had no place in Europe's incessant wars. If you think I sound like I'm 100% isolationist, he said, if there's such a thing as 1,000% isolationist, I'm that. Looking back, I find it terribly hard to put any finger on what, what Joe Kennedy really believed. I don't think he was a profound thinker to start with. As he said in one of his speeches somewhere, we, we, we're just going to have to learn to get along with dictators. They're just going to have to learn to get along with us. Joseph Kennedy, the American ambassador in London, was considered to be a, a defeatist. But one can well see why. But in our dire situation, facing as Churchill called it, the unbroken might of the German army, uh, and ill-prepared, it, it was pure logic. For the moment, Kennedy's logic appeared correct. News reaching Downing Street grew worse. The Belgian army was being routed. The French were falling back towards Paris. But Churchill was irrepressible, and some who had first doubted him quickly revised their opinions. He was to be seen coming down the garden path with that great resolve and the, the jutting out chin and the contagious air of, of confidence and the job to be done. And very soon indeed, the whole attitude to him changed. It was as if a superhuman current of electricity had gone through number 10 Downing Street. He had this wonderful ability to go into a deep sleep for an hour, sometimes with a black bandage over his eyes, and awake refreshed. 
and he reckoned it gave him two days out of every 24 hours in which to work and he would then go on until two, three or four in the morning. Incredible. One has to remember also that this man was already 65 years old. Under Britain's newly amended Defence Regulation 18B, the police have swooped upon the British Union of Fascists' London headquarters. Churchill's energy had a ruthless side. Peacetime civil rights were suspended as police were sent to arrest hundreds of British fascists and suspected fascist sympathizers, including a conservative MP, leading members of the British aristocracy, and even two of Churchill's own relatives. Churchill tried to energize the British economy. Trade unions agreed to suspend normal working regulations, and factory production quickly accelerated. Next, Churchill established a new volunteer army to defend the home front. Thousands rushed to join. My uncle, the captain in the First World War, and uh, he had gone down to the police station to become a local defense volunteer, and he took the big bits of furniture out of the house and put them across the road and came back and said to my aunt, his wife, uh, well, they won't come through tonight. Now a word about the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, better known, of course, as the WAPS. The is that British it... women, too, were volunteering in ever-increasing numbers. No idea what we were joining, really. Especially we didn't have any idea what girls were going to be allowed to do. But it was exciting. Double eight four two one nine. You never forget your service number. We see the girls about the place and we admire their smart appearance, but few of us stop to think, what's their work like? A sergeant wouldn't let me tow an aircraft. He said he wasn't having a woman doing that. They thought we could only drive the staff cars. Well, that's a nonsense. So we were soon driving all the lorries and everything. The Edith Heap was 20 years old, a wool merchant's daughter from Yorkshire. She was living away from home for the first time in her life. It was always a social side. We always managed to go to the parties and, and out to dinner, whatever, however tired you went out. And of course, as WAFs, we had to clean our houses before we went out. We were not allowed out unless it was spotless. And I mean spotless, because the sergeant used to go around with a white napkin and if there was any dust you had to do it all again like most british people at this moment edith heap was unaware of the disaster unfolding just across the english channel in northern france we didn't know all that much about it we only got the filtering of little bits of news it was it was too anxious i think for them to tell us too much <laughs> The British Army searched for positions where they could try to halt the German advance. Ernie Leggett's battalion was on the march. Mile after mile of straight road, we had to march mostly all the way back. We couldn't stop to get food. You can walk when you're in your sleep. And we've proved it because uh, on one night alone, we marched uh, just about 30 miles. And of course, the only time you woke up was when you bumped into the person in front or the person behind bumped into you. Most of us were young lads of only 20 years of age, and it was a, a trauma for us. After two days of marching, Leggett's unit was ordered to make a stand at this derelict factory in Belgium. We went into what I thought was a cement factory. And of course, we could see well around. In the woods, about 120, 50 yards away, we could see the Germans preparing. My brother had a shotgun and used to shoot rabbits. And of course, uh, I used to shoot rabbits as well, even as a small boy. You know? So uh, consequently, I was a good shot. 
My first German I uh, put away, I remember he was on the right-hand side, and I saw him crawling along and, and then get up to run. I, I just uh, pulled the trigger. See him drop, and he was still there, but a day later. Underneath my breath, I, I uh, muttered the Lord's Prayer, which uh, I, I knew then, I knew it as a schoolboy, by heart. Our Father, which art in heaven... Had a wonderful boyhood in the country, out in the rural district of Norfolk. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we... Went to Sunday school, went to church. I don't know why, I, I just, just went. I had that feeling that um, God was for me. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. And in our east window, there is the cross case of St Peter. Somehow it captivated me and I couldn't take my mind off it. When we eventually went to France and landed, the first thing I saw was on the wings of our vehicles and everything, was the um, cross keys of St. Peter. And immediately I said to myself, Ernie, that is a good omen. You are going to be safe. For the moment, Ernie Leggett was safe. His unit successfully defended its makeshift fortress. But back in London, inside Downing Street, Churchill's cabinet was now planning for the worst. There was enormous anxiety, of course, quiet anxiety. People went about their business there. There was no panic. But this was Churchill's lead. There was a tremendous flow of minutes and, and directives, and there were these labels introduced. Action this day, report to me on one side of a page. Respectable civil servants were seen actually running down the corridors of Whitehall. Britain was gearing up for total war. Streets and parks filled with men and women practicing to resist air raids, gas attacks, parachute landings. For some children, it was all a great game. Everyone came out into the streets, sandbags appeared, piles of sand. Everyone seemed to be like ants, beavering to create sandbags outside their house. And everyone hopped out and filled up the bags and there we were working like little beavers and I remember thinking to myself this is fun this is war they were collecting iron railings we had iron railings in front of our house and they were just whipped away one day my dog thought that was great because he could hop up and rush out without being penned in anymore we used to take great pride drawing lines on big sheets of brown paper and cutting up this brown paper and pasting stripes across the window. The object of that, of course, being that if there was a, a bomb blast, the brown paper would hold the glass together. As Britain prepared, the American people were listening to the first radio news reports of German victories in France. The latest French communique reports that there has been incessant fighting in the north, that the Allied troops are carrying out their retreat in what is called good order. And now the latest news direct. First, William L. Shira reports from the German capital, so go ahead, Berlin. Good evening, this is Berlin. The great battle of Flanders, as it will probably go down in history, is rapidly nearing its end. The German high command stated flatly today with the destruction of the English and French armies still fighting there. Reports of German success fueled a feeling in the United States that Hitler was unstoppable. Listening in a New York townhouse was a young journalist named Whitelaw Reed, whose family owned the influential newspaper, the New York Herald Tribune. Well, it was very depressing news with Germany ripping through Europe the way it did. And in America, people were very pessimistic about England's chances of holding Hitler off. Well, it just made you sort of uh, sick to your stomach. Uh, things were going so badly, and you didn't know how Hitler could be stopped. 
the only armored force with a chance of stopping Hitler before his armies reached the English Channel was Peter Vox's tank regiment. On the 21st of May, they were ordered into battle near the town of Arras. I reported to the colonel, and I said, this is going to be the real thing, colonel, isn't it? He said, yes, Peter, it's a real thing this time. I didn't, at that stage, wonder about my own courage. But I think I did think I wonder what's going to happen to us all. We came to the start line, which was the railway, but the level crossing gates were shut. And the bell was ringing. Ridiculous. There were no trains, as we knew perfectly well ourselves. And it took an old soldier, one of the squadron commanders, to drive straight through those gates and send them flying in all directions. And that stopped the bell ringing. And then everybody went through and over the railway and up a small slope to the other side through some scrub. And there at the top in front of us was a whole stream of German lorries and trucks half-tracks, motorcyclists. We waded into them. Everybody did. There was no bloodlust in it at all. But these were the sort of targets that we'd been trained to shoot at. And we shot at them. That must have been a shock for them, I guess, and it was a great pleasure for, for us. And then gradually, I think the Germans seemed to disperse. A moment of victory gave the British Army hope that it could turn the tide. Just 25 miles away, Ernie Leggett's battalion was also stalling the German offensive. Just after dawn, very early in the morning, they started to machine gun, mortar fire, shell, and goodness knows what, and we could see them coming across at us. All hell was let loose. And of course, what did we do? We, we had to defend ourselves, and we just shot back. In the woods opposite us, we saw them falling, but they couldn't get across the river. I mean, excuse my language, but it was like shooting ducks. We, we, we couldn't help but uh, disperse them. Just shoot to kill. Later on, they came again, and they weren't worried about their dead. They just ran over them. And, and a sort of... Uh, sickness sort of enveloped us and thought to well, who on earth could do a thing like that? I had no feelings of regret. The, the only thing I think about sometimes is that the Germans who I, I, I uh, put away, uh, they had wives and families but that's war. At Arras, British tanks were still advancing when the German commander, General Rommel, launched a powerful counterattack. It was rather like when there's a tremendous thunderstorm overhead and you're waiting for the lightning. I saw one of our tanks burst into flames and the commander jump out and he was shot. And then I saw the colonel's tank and the whole front of the tank was blown in. And I knew the colonel was dead. He must be. It was at this moment that, as our backs were now to the enemy, one really felt the appalling sense of doom that our regiment really had been destroyed. And 
It was destroyed right here, right round one. And there were the bodies. It seemed wrong to be leaving the bodies lying there in and on the smoldering tanks. Of the 40 tanks that Peter Vox had led into battle, only 12 survived. The road to the English Channel was now wide open, and German units were soon at the coast. For the first time, residents of Dover could hear the sound of the enemy that was menacing their country. Suddenly, it seemed to burst upon us in Dover. We never realized how bad things were going in France because the propaganda kept it from us. We just couldn't believe what was happening. We dreaded air raids. We knew it was coming. There is a silence between one battle and the next, which is a deadly silence. You can hear even the grass moving. The birds stop singing. Nobody speaks. Everything is so quiet that it's, uh, it's, it's just unbelievable. They hadn't attacked. We hadn't seen any Germans. The Lance Corporal said to me, Ernie, just nip across to see that the bastards haven't infiltrated on our left flank. I put my rifle down and uh, was crouching across this thing, and all of a sudden, I just hit the ceiling. And then I hit the floor, and uh, I was numb from my waist downwards. I couldn't feel a thing, but I could see blood just pouring out. I'd had a piece of shrapnel go through my buttock and out through the groin. A mortar shell had exploded here, just feet away from Ernie Leggett. It was the first salvo in a fierce new attack on the cement factory. Leggett, bleeding heavily, unable to walk, was now trapped. I'm thinking, well, th th this is it, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna die. I was thinking to myself, please, God, don't let me be bayoneted. You know, that lunge and the turning and the pulling out. <sighs> oh, dreadful. I just thought, that's my religion let me down and uh, my good omen had gone and, and I was gonna die. I know I prayed and um, I could see things at home vividly. Minutes later, I'd more or less come to myself and uh, thought to myself, well, it's no good here. I can be uh, mortared, I could be shelled, I could be bombed from above. And uh, I got on the opposite side of the railway line and uh, found I couldn't walk, so I started to crawl. I was crawling like that, legs dragging behind, crawling my hands, and, and my fingernails had worn away, crawling along those rough stones. There must have been German snipers, they were firing at me. I must have passed out because the next thing I knew, I'd got somebody hold my wrist and they were pulling me. And I looked up into the faces of uh, uh, two men who I knew, and I heard well, I don't know which one it was, but one said the other, bloody hell, he's had it. And I involuntarily said, well, please help me. Ernie Leggett was carried to a field hospital, one of only five survivors from a platoon of 30 men. After the disaster at Arras, Peter Vox had become separated from the rest of his unit. With him in his tank were a corporal and a major. 
We'd now run off the edge of our maps. Alice is at the bottom of a map sheet, so we had no maps. When we got to the main Alice Dulance road, instead of crossing over it, Corporal Burrows, the driver, turned left. When I came up and looked around me, I didn't know where I was. We saw there were German vehicles, and we were arriving and joining the, the party. And I really didn't know what to do. But my driver was a wonderful chap. He changed down, and he just moved at a steady 12 miles an hour or so. You must remember it was dark. No lights, nobody had any lights. And he crashed into the back of the lorry. The men in the lorry all shouted. The officer swore. He cleared the uh, half-tracks out of the way. He indicated to us to go on and get the hell out of it. And so we did. In the confusion, the German officer cleared a path for Peter Vox's tank to pass through. I wore berry, Germans tank crews wore berry, and I don't think he realized for a moment that we weren't a German tank. Roosevelt's ambassador in London advised him that Britain could be under German control within weeks. Ambassador Kennedy's opinion was now shared by the British minister he saw almost daily. Foreign Secretary Lord Halifax started talking about the need for a negotiated peace with Germany. Churchill, too, was growing desperate. He cabled Washington begging for urgent military aid. Without it, he warned, you may have a completely subjugated, Nazified Europe established with astonishing swiftness. But instead of sending Churchill the supplies he was demanding, President Roosevelt launched a secret diplomatic initiative to prepare for Britain's imminent defeat. He turned first to America's northern neighbor, Canada, a self-governing dominion of the British Empire. Roosevelt asked the Canadian government to send an envoy to Washington. A senior diplomat traveled south and was smuggled into the White House. What he heard there was reported back to Ottawa and shocked Canada's Prime Minister, William Mackenzie King. I question if ever in the history of the world a message came back picturing possibilities more appalling than those communications revealed. Roosevelt feared that Britain's Royal Navy, the most powerful fleet in the world, was about to fall into Hitler's hands. He wanted Mackenzie King's government to persuade Churchill not to make what he called a soft peace that would give the Navy to Hitler, but instead to send the fleet over the Atlantic to be based in Canada. The president wanted me to bring pressure to bear on England not to make a soft peace even though it might mean the destruction of England, comparable to that of Poland, Holland, and Belgium, and the killing of those who had refused to make the peace. For a moment, it seemed to me that the United States was seeking to save itself at the expense of Britain. As Canadian politicians agonized about Roosevelt's approach, the British Army was falling back towards the English Channel, fighting for its life in a series of bitter rearguard actions. We were putting up a good fight. They couldn't get across the river. We had no qualms about killing Germans. It's not exhilarating. It's just you're doing your job. The things you've been trained for for years. In other words, you're just accepted as part and parcel of your life. Martin McLean from Newcastle had joined the army at 16 when his local shipyard closed. Married with a new baby, he was the youngest sergeant major in the infantry, in charge of his battalion's mortar platoon. In the chaos of battle, communications failed, and McLean was left without orders. The Germans overrun one of the companies. 
And this is the sad part of it all. Through me not receiving orders, they, they brought in a regiment of a, a company from another regiment to do an attack. McLean was not told that these British troops were moving forward directly into his line of fire. See, they launched the way out of a wood. We couldn't see them, but they were in the close vicinity of our weapons. And these lads launched into our three-inch mortar fire, and some of them went down. And we're still firing the three-inch mortar when they ran into our fire. To this day, nobody knows how many troops were killed in this accident of war. A short while afterwards, when I saw this happen, I'm telling you the honest truth, I drew my pistol out and shoot myself. That's fact. And uh, the men took the pistol off us because I would have killed myself. But I was devastated. And from all my service, I had them lads on my mind. It disturbed my mind quite a lot. Peter Vox and his two companions were now completely isolated and deep behind enemy lines. Corporal Burrows, the driver, reported that the petrol was getting very low. And so we thought if we could get to one of the villages where we were billeted, we might find some friends there. We might be able to fill up the tank. If not, we'll have to take to our feet. Well, we went to such a village and it, uh, there were German tanks in it. And now Barra said, it, it shows empty. Uh, we've got to get rid of the tank. And we pulled into an orchard and the tank was actually spluttering as we did so. The one thing we were not going to do was to surrender. Uh, we, it was bad enough that we weren't with a regiment. We were not going to surrender and we were going to get back to our own troops somehow. a sudden rustle in the bushes behind us and out sprang a German officer. He snatched the binoculars off my neck, but he didn't take the pistol from round my waist. And then he said, go, 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 go. And we were marched off. And we didn't march quite fast enough. He said, go on, go, go, schnell, schnell. First was the corporal, uh, then me, and then the major, and the German officer side by side. The major actually dropped behind the German officer and dived into the bushes. And the German turned and fired a shot at him, but he missed. I got my pistol out and uh, I was shooting back and I shot four shots without hitting him. Uh, the fifth shot, when he was still some distance away, went right into his chest. He ran towards me shooting and to my astonishment, he kept on running, he kept on shooting, he kept on shouting. And he came right up to me and leant against me. I had one shot left. And I put it into him and he fell down, dead. And we turned and we ran with all our might down the hill as fast as we could. Down the hill we went and arrived at a, a, a ruined abbey at the, down at the bottom and we hid in there panting. And only then did I realize that 
I'd killed this man. And now I did feel an awful feeling of guilt. It was ridiculous, because if I hadn't, we'd all have been prisoners and I might have been dead as well. Acting on behalf of President Roosevelt, the Canadian government urged Churchill to make a pledge on the future of his Navy, to declare that it would be sent across the Atlantic if Britain lost the war. But Churchill refused. He told the Canadians that even to discuss the subject would encourage defeatism at a moment when he was trying his best to spread confidence. Canadian Prime Minister Mackenzie King was caught uncomfortably between Churchill and Roosevelt. Although the diplomatic circuits buzzed with activity, the result was a bad-tempered stalemate. As Western politicians argued, German tank columns moved up the French coast, threatening to block the British Army's only route home. On May 23rd, they reached the port of Boulogne. Churchill immediately dispatched a flotilla of destroyers to help defend it. When we reached the estuary there, we found all these French destroyers, and they were bombarding, and of course we didn't know what they were bombarding, but when you looked up on the heights there, there was a whole load of um, German tanks and infantry and heaven knows what. Ian Nethercott was a 19-year-old able seaman on board the destroyer HMS Keith. I was on the gun, we were at action stations, and as we came in, there was some German motorbike troops at the far end, just beginning to creep forward onto the jetty, so we opened up on them. And because there was a whole load of arms and legs and bits of motorbike flying around, because two pounds of shells make a hell of a mess when you hit someone with them, you know. Many of the British soldiers gathered at the port were inexperienced troops from support units. As the Germans attacked, some of these men began to panic. Well, it was just a rabble, sort of, sort of mad football crowd, if you know what I mean. Some jumped into the water and swam round the ship and tried to climb up on the bloody sides. Some had already got on the ship and hidden themselves down below. And, uh, uh, you know, we were too busy on the gun to sort of worry about the torpedo men had to clear them off. And then the skipper got some of the uh, stokers the fire parties with rifles and bayonets to get them off. Other British troops were fighting hard, holding the Germans on the fringes of the town. Then German armor burst through to the harbor. Tanks were soon exchanging fire with destroyers. Two more British warships entered the harbor to assist, the Venomous and the Whitsit, both under the command of aggressive captains. Witched came in and started blasting away every single thing it could see. He didn't care whether it was friendly or unfriendly. He just blew it all down. He was that sort of chap, you know. And the Venomous was as well. In fact, the, uh, the midshipman on the Venomous, he blew down about three hotels, I think, on the front because... And, he, and there was a tank in between two, two lots of walls and he brought the whole bloody lot down on this tank and another tank, it stopped a shell from a 4.7 right on the front of it, and it did a backward somersault. They'd never seen anything like it. It just rolled over and over, because it's a big shell. It's 80 pounds, you know. A new menace came from above, Stuka dive bombers. After suffering many casualties, the Navy was told to evacuate the remaining British troops and abandon Boulogne to the Germans. We'd got dead people all over the place, or wounded people, laying around, especially down on the mass decks. A lot had got down there and died down there, you know. But they were soldiers, and because and, soldiers, you can't bury them at sea. But our blokes were all collected up on our way across the channel and we buried them off the van. It was landed 
in London this morning that the Germans gained possession of Boulogne last night. The grim facts of this war could no longer be kept from the British public. Homes all over the country now received the first telegrams reporting the death or capture of relatives. But she said, are you there, Mrs. Erd? My mother said, oh, come in, Mrs. whatever it was. And it was about tea time. And she sat down with one of those sighs, you know. Hey, I don't know. She said, what's the matter, love? She said, well, he's missing. She said, well, missing isn't... They haven't said he was killed or anything. I mean, oh, no, but, I mean, if he's missing. And every day that was the conversation, still missing. Many had to wait for news of missing sons, husbands, or fiancés. I was 17. I was in love. I was... I'd met the man of my dreams. He was tall, dark, very handsome. All we wanted to do was to be together. I used to resent seeing other people walking about who weren't in the army, and I used to realise, well, that's not fair because they've got their job to do the same as he has, but you couldn't help but feel that. My mother went to the front door. It must have been raining for our front door to be shut. And she said, hello, but I can't think what her name was. Come in a minute, love. What a terrible day, isn't it? She the front door, and then she came. And she said, what are you looking so cheerful about? She said, he's a prisoner of war. We knew she went. And my mother said, oh, well, there you are. And she said, they'll not shoot him. They won't kill him, will they? She said, oh, no, no, they go in a camp and he'll be fed and everything. My mother having no idea what the hell they did with them, with them you know. Mrs Comforter, my mother was. In France, the German army was closing in from every side. A few miles inland, Martin McLean's battalion was running short of ammunition, medical supplies, and hope. There was a really big battle going on. And the Germans were well in among us then, by this time. The men were coming out wounded. And uh, one of my lads was shot in the privates, and the blood was squirting from him down his trouser legs. And he says, Sergeant Major, and he pleaded with us. I said, oh, nothing I can do. I knew he was going to die, and we had, no, we had nothing there to help him. You see, you've got no field dressings. You've got no bandages. What can you do? When a man's dying, he's bleeding quickly. His face drains, white. And you know that he's going to die, so that was it. I was more responsible for now for the rest of the men to get them out. We were on our own. The company commander says, what are we going to do? I said, give the order, every man for himself, because now we were completely demoralised. And you thought nothing else but survival. Survival, really, at the finish. With his army about to be overwhelmed, Churchill gave a desperate order the evacuation of all British forces from northern France. The operation was planned here at Dover Castle. 350,000 men had to be transported across the English Channel. The admiral responsible estimated that he could get only 40,000 of them home. And next, the British capital and the report of Edward R. Morrow. Go ahead, London. This is London. On the home front, new defense measures are being announced almost hourly. Any newspaper opposing the prosecution of the war can now be suppressed. Neutral vessels arriving in British ports are being carefully searched for concealed troops. Refugees arriving from the continent are being closely questioned in an effort to weed out spies. Londoners are doing their best to preserve their sense of humor. But I saw more grave, solemn faces today than I have ever seen in London. Fashionable tea rooms were almost deserted. I saw one woman standing in line waiting for a bus begin to cry very quietly. She didn't even bother to wipe the tears away. In Regent Street, there was a sandwich man. His sign in big red letters had only three words on it. Watch and pray. I have asked that Sunday next should be observed as a day of national prayer. Britain needed a miracle. 
King George VI called his people to prayer. Across the sea to join their prayers with ours. On May 26th, as the nation prayed, Churchill presented his war cabinet with the harsh truth. Belgium had fallen. France was on the brink of collapse. America was staying neutral. The Soviet Union was sticking to its alliance with Hitler. Britain stood alone. But there was an alternative. A peace offer had been drafted in Berlin. Give Hitler a free hand in Europe and Britain could keep her independence, her empire, and even her navy. Lord Halifax argued that the time had finally come to talk peace. If independence is not at stake, then I think it right to accept an offer which would save the country from avoidable disaster. The cabinet was divided. Some wanted to explore the peace offer. Churchill wanted to fight on. The meeting ended in deadlock. In the rush to reach the coast, British soldiers destroyed their heavy equipment to keep it out of German hands. We went down this road, and that's where we start seeing the devastation of a withdrawn army. And all these lorries smashed up and broken up. Walking through there is just like, to me, a scene from Dante's Inferno. I think everyone at this stage you now is just hoping for getting it out, getting out getting onto a boat, getting away. The next day, Churchill reconvened the war cabinet. Again, they discussed the German peace initiative. Churchill urged his colleagues to reject it. Let us not be dragged down with France. The approach proposed is not only futile, but involves us in deadly danger. Lord Halifax was incensed. Winston talks the most frightful rot. He works himself up into a passion of emotion when he ought to make his brain think and reason. I told him our ways must separate. After just 17 days in office, Churchill was facing the collapse of his cabinet and the loss of most of his army. Inside an ambulance packed with wounded men, Ernie Leggett was on his way to the coast. I was continually dosed with morphine, and I must have looked uh, one hell of a sight because uh, at that time, uh, uh, the stretcher bearers would, in your own blood, they'd put on your forehead what was wrong, like um, tourniquet and um, uh, uh, morphine or whatever drug you were having. And I, uh, they tell me that I had a T and an M written in my own blood on my forehead. I remember the ambulance being stopped, the back doors open. I don't know where the hell I was. And I was taken across the road and I, I, I knew I was by the sea because I could smell the air. Around the port of Dunkirk, over a third of a million men were waiting for rescue with little shelter from shelling or air attack. the Royal Navy called for help from the British people. Manned by volunteers from all over the country, hundreds of small boats, trawlers and paddle steamers, pleasure cruisers and tugs set out across the English Channel. As they sailed towards the inferno of Dunkirk, the world held its breath. All around Britain, families feared that their loved ones were about to be lost. The evacuation started badly. With the harbor destroyed, most troops had to be lifted directly out of the water. The men were standing in a long line right out to the water, and the leading ones were up to here, been standing there for hours, waiting for one boat to come in, and, and the minute it got there, they all hung on to the side and took the bloody boat over, see? So you, you had all this problem of emptying the boat of water and trying to get them in again. By the end of the second day, less than a tenth of the men had been evacuated. The German army was closing in fast, threatening to capture all who remained. 
and from the skies, bombers attacked continually. You could hear the bombs dropping, the shells from the big warships booming out to sea, and there was just one huge pall of smoke, black, horrible smoke, oily smoke in the sky. Dimmed the sun at times. I couldn't walk, and I was at the mercy of whatever happened. I, I, I just couldn't get away. When danger got close, when the bombs were dropping, then my comrades would cover me up with their own bodies to shield me from being wounded further. That, that is what you call comradeship. Over 200 British and French warships were soon involved in the rescue mission, along with hundreds of smaller civilian craft. Ian Nethercott's destroyer, HMS Keith, sailed to Dunkirk through waters menaced by German bombs and torpedoes. The wakeful had been coming out full of troops. She was blown completely in half, and they lost about 800 soldiers in the water. And a lot of them are still floating about, you know, floating in towards the beaches in their overcoats and God knows what. On some parts of the beaches, they'd had to stop rowing and pump because there were so many bodies floating in the shallows that you couldn't get your oar in and pull them into the beach. So you just had to punt the boat through all these corpses to get into the beach. A little cutter pulled alongside a person with a megaphone shouting, You'll all have to go back on the beaches. Nine out of 12 ships have been sunk. And you know, you reel back, ships sunk? Tw nine out of 12. He says, we'll try our best to get you off tomorrow. So back we went. Along with the remains of his unit, Martin McLean had been waiting his turn to be rescued for three days and three nights. We were shocked to think that we were going to be left prisoners of war. I was. And the Germans were shelling, and a, a shell had hit the granite pier. And we come across this pile of French soldiers, and they were all mown down. Blokes on the bottom with legs off, dead. Others piled up mourning. A bloke stuck in the middle with his juggler van, cut here, and he's pleading for help, and the blood's squirting from him. We were so shocked, we shot off there onto the sand and left them, but we'll come back to do what we could for them. But it was hopeless. They'd killed all these men. What a wasted life. While most of their comrades still waited for rescue, the first shiploads of troops arrived home to a nation in shock at the scale of the disaster in France. I cycled down to see the troops arrive at the pier. They was in a terrible state. Many was laying along the seafront, thoroughly exhausted. We could see the full horror of what was happening in the channel. The worst part about it was seeing other people come home. And you would think, well, he's, he's not back yet. He's not here. Is he going to be all right? He was never out of my thoughts, really. My friend's husband had come home two days before, and those 48 hours, I, I really began to think he wasn't going to come back. In Downing Street, Churchill also waited anxiously for news. As the fate of his army hung in the balance, he was now under intense pressure from Lord Halifax to respond to Hitler's peace initiative. Then in Halifax's absence, Churchill summoned his other ministers to his room in the Commons. He implored them once again to reject any deal and to fight on whatever the cost to their country or themselves. 
If this long island story of ours is to end at last, let it end only when each of us lies choking in his own blood upon the ground. Churchill's words united a fragile cabinet. But if he could not get his army safely home, he knew that his leadership and his war policy would soon be threatened once again. Five days into the evacuation, the rescue fleet faced the largest German air attack so far. We were about a mile off the pier heads at Dunkirk, and when you looked to the north, you could see this great cloud of German aircraft, and, and it, was, it was amazing. There was layer upon layer of them, fighters riding above them. They all peeled off and we had 70 on us and the skipper worked up to full speed and he was slinging the ship from side to side. And I just suddenly saw this stupor appearing over the bridge, practically it seemed to be almost touching it, and this great big bloody yellow bomb in its clamps. It was a thousand pounder. Blew a part of the port side in. The next bomb blew up down in the engine room. It killed everyone down there. There was no one alive down there. And the coxswain standing up on the signal deck, screaming out, abandoned ship. And we took to the water. Already in the water, you'd got survivors from five or six ships. They were all floundering around in the oil, screaming and yelling. And the water was bloody cold. And I'd got this cork life jacket on, which kept me up at any rate. And we hung on to this carly raft and paddled away. And we'd only got a few yards, and uh, a couple of these German Messerschmitts came down, and they just opened up and pointed straight at us. And, just blazed away right across the top of the raft and killed the two blokes in it. And I tried to dive under the water to get away and couldn't. I got my head under, but my bloody feet were sticking up. <laughs> and I got a bullet right through the bloody knee. Anyway, I floated away and I passed out in the water. And when I came to, I was on my own then. And then I thought, well, I don't know, I'm probably going to die. And I had a long talk with my God. And... I was trying to think what it was we used to be taught. Strength now, my fainting soul, and play the man, and through such waning span of life as still to be trod, prepare to meet my God. He used to say that. On the day that Ian Nethercott's destroyer was lost, 30 other ships were sunk. But still, the operation continued without interruption, and the Navy, aided now by over 600 small civilian craft, carried another 64,000 men away to safety. We went queued up for to get on the boats the next day, and a destroyer pulled in, and it, there's the skipper or the, someone on the, on the bridge shouting, oh, on this crazy can, jump, lads, jump. We jumped in, and the sailors were grabbing us and pulling us in, and it pulled out, and then the bomber came along, and he dropped his bombs. And it straddled the back of the boat, and the back of the, the ship lifted up and the water came over, but we got away all right. After four days waiting without food or shelter, Martin McLean was finally crossing the English Channel. Landed in a port, and I shouted up to the man, what place is this, mate? He says, it's Dover, mate, this is Dover. I couldn't believe it.
next thing I remember was waking up, and I, I'm certain it was at New Haven, and uh, along came a, a Salvation Army nurse with a trolley, and uh, she gave me a lovely hot mug of tea and a cigarette. They laid me on the jetty at Dover, and I was sent to um, some crummy hospital at the back there in Kent. It was me thinking I was going to have a lovely time in a civilian hospital with pretty nurses, and all. I landed up in Gilliam with these monkey face sods in the Navy, you know, the sick bay tiffies, you know, with the cruelest man out. Trains from all over southern England were commandeered to take the troops away from the channel ports. Martin McLean, 300 miles away from home, was desperate to let his wife know that he was safe. We got on the train and I had a luggage label in my pocket, ordinary tie on label. And I wrote on there the wife's address and I wrote on the back, arrive safe and blighty, be seeing you soon I hope. <laughs> and I slung it out without a stamp on. She got that from a postman coming down the street. And she, we still got her, by the way. And she, 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 he's waving at and says, he's all right, all right. Because <laughs> when the mail was coming, the wives were all out looking for it, you know. I was at the hairdressers when I got home. His sister was around saying, Fred's home. Oh, I couldn't describe the joy I felt. And when I went down to his mother's, we just hugged each other. And he hadn't had a shave. He wasn't washed. He was hungry. He'd had nothing to eat, hardly, but a lorry load of salmon they'd found on the way that had been abandoned. Never faced salmon afterwards. The evacuation had gone better than anyone had dared to hope. Almost all the stranded British soldiers were rescued, along with 80,000 French troops. Relief at the return of so many men temporarily masked what had been the most crushing humiliation in the history of the British Army. It was a massive defeat. It was a retreat, but it was turned into the most marvelous, heart-stirring miracle, really. This is the most magnificent sight of a generation. This is the army under its magnificent leaders. They have come back from a terrible and bitter battle, but still in their tired and half-closed eyes is mirrored the spirit and cause for which they fight. That has not gone. That can never be taken away from them. Churchill seized the moment, speaking to the world in defiant tones. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. We thought him a savior. He was a bulldog of a man. He had some funny ways. But when he said, we'll fight them on the beaches, great. We'll fight them on here and there, everywhere. That done the, the troops and the world and the country wonders. Despite the odds against us, he made us believe that we could actually win, that we were unconquerable. And he was asked in the, in the dire moment after the collapse of France and Dunkirk, when we, we really stood alone, and in the, that moment of enormous peril, he was asked if the, our paintings from the, from the uh, National Gallery should be sent to Canada for safety. And he said, no, no. They should be hidden in caves and cellars. We are going to beat them. But Lord Halifax was not so sure. He made contingency plans in case Churchill's bravado, as he called it, should fail. Behind the Prime Minister's back, the Foreign Office sent a message to Germany via a Swedish diplomat, 
keeping open the option of peace talks. Churchill quickly learned of the exchange and was furious. He ordered his ministers to have no such conversations with foreign diplomats, and instead to spread confidence in Britain's ultimate victory at all times. Not every British soldier was home. Peter Vaux was still on the run in German-occupied France. With two comrades from his abandoned tank, he was hiding in an old monastery. We realized that we were quite close to the River Somme, and if we could only get there and get across, there would be French troops the other side. So we um, decided uh, to walk to the Somme. And we got into marshes, and we got into bogs, and it was ghastly. And we, we were hungry and exhausted and cold. And from time to time, we saw Germans and heard German voices. And we sloshed about in these marshes, and we couldn't get anywhere near the river, which is what we wanted to do. And it was at that point that the Major said, I don't know, we may have to give ourselves up. And I said, not yet. And the Corporal said, not me, sir. The men returned to the monastery. Local French villagers were afraid to help them, but a refugee from Belgium, Monsieur Gilly, offered to show Peter Vaux the best place to cross the river. Vaux, in borrowed clothes, posed as a refugee himself. We passed two or three little positions of Germans until we got right down almost to the river bank. You could see the river bank. And there was a German position there with a sergeant major and uh, they had a machine gun. And he said, well, let's have a look at your identity card. So she produced his identity card, perfectly in order, of course. And then he turned to me and said, and yours? And this Belgian was superb. He turned on him like a tiger. He said, as he told me afterwards, he said, you are a revolting race. Here is this boy, only speaks Flemish, parents killed by your horrible uh, aeroplanes, walked all the way from Belgium, and you ask him for an identity card? Uh, the German was quite shattered. He said, go on, go on, get away, the pair of you. So we went away. But when I was asked for my identity card, my heart stood still. Peter Vox rejoined his companions in the monastery. The three fugitives decided to wait until late that night and then try to swim across the river under the cover of darkness. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Churchill's words were broadcast in the United States. Journalist Whitelaw Reed listened alongside former President Herbert Hoover. I was very concerned at the time, of course, about Britain. Um, and I was thrilled by Churchill's words. Uh, it, it was a terrific speech, I think, for rallying the forces and rallying people around the world to the, to the English cause. But at that same time, uh, Herbert Hoover was in the household. He, alas, was sort of glum about it, thinking that it was too late and it was too late for America to do anything. And I just got a very negative feeling about his reaction to it all. Anyone in America who wanted to help Britain in 1940 had to contend with the powerful isolationist movement. Under the banner of America First, tens of thousands attended rallies demanding their country's absolute neutrality. The mainstream of isolationism is the America First Committee, one of the most powerful mass movements the U.S. has ever seen. Folk hero Charles Lindbergh symbolizes its grassroots nature along with one-time governor Alfalfa Bill Murray and Montana's senator Burton Wheeler. He advocates the theory that the policy of isolation is as valid in 1940 as it was in 1776. I believe this is realized even by the British 
government. But they have one last desperate plan remaining. They hope that they may be able to persuade us to send another American expeditionary force to Europe. I think they believed in a fortress America that we could be strong and stay on our own. And I thought that America should come of age and that we had to become involved and take responsibility for what was going on. There was another reason why Washington did not rush to Britain's aid. Many there were concerned about Winston Churchill's reputation as a heavy drinker. Roosevelt reportedly told his cabinet, I suppose Churchill is the best man that England has, even if he is drunk half the time. He's very unreliable when under the influence of drink. Churchill's enemies in London shared the same anxiety. They believed that the Prime Minister's war policy was driven by bravado, Dutch courage. Downing Street Secretary Marion Holmes saw Churchill every day. Oh yes, he was a regular drinker. He drank quite a bit of brandy after, but after a huge meal, he drank with food. That was the point. I remember him being served lunch at Czechs. He was very tired and he was working from bed and decided to have lunch in bed, sardines, which he loved. And uh, there were two carafes on the tray. One had whiskey in it and one had water. And I watched him pour his whiskey onto his sardines and uh, the water was still in the other carafe. And so I felt this, I've got to intervene here and mention it. He said, oh, I must be going dotty, you know. But he never drank to the point of being the worse for wear. And I remember him once saying, I've taken more out of alcohol than alcohol has taken out of me. And that really summed it up. Peter Vaux and his two comrades waited for night to fall before making their escape across the River Somme. One of them left a memento of his time hiding in the old monastery buildings. That was Corporal Burroughs. He came from Wiltshire, and he'd been my driver for a long time. You know, with a tank, you you're your driver, and you, you are very, very close indeed. The rank doesn't enter into it, really. That night, we did indeed go down to the, to the river bank. The sergeant major wasn't there, but there were patrols up and down. And we waited and watched them, and we realized there was actually a gap of 10 minutes between the time people went up and down. So we stripped off all our clothes and did them up in a bundle, which the Major swam across with. The Corporal wasn't a very good swimmer. And I said, I, well, I, I'll help you across. And we set off. But we'd all forgotten one thing, and that was we hadn't eaten now for nearly a week. And we were absolutely exhausted and I suppose the modern expression would be we were also stressed out there was no doubt about it and that everything went wrong the major did get across the corporal began to sink and I grabbed him by the arms and tried, tried to pull him and human bodies in water is slippery, and his arms slipped from my hands. I didn't grip tight enough. I just hadn't the strength to do it. And I actually dived in and down and tried to get him back, but I couldn't. And he was gone. I, I failed. And then I don't remember getting out of that river, but somehow I was on, I found myself on the far bank. I longed to have saved him. 
the thing that haunted me for the rest of my life. Peter Vox was helped by French soldiers and finally made his way home to Britain. Soon afterwards, Paris fell and the French government opened peace talks with Adolf Hitler. Residents of England's southern coast expected to be the next target. We knew after the defeat of our army, the invasion from Germany was coming. We'd wake up in the mornings and quite expect to see German troops stalking the town. The population of Dover was 40,000. It dropped to 18,000 at that time. The town was deserted. But Dover was then becoming a fortress. Anti-aircraft batteries, the seafront was barbed wired. They was erecting these concrete pillboxes overnight. All the hotels at the, at the, at the front at Westcliff uh, had been taken over by the Navy, and uh, the barbed wire was going up all along there. But at that time, um, you saw a lot of the Navy about it. Well, you know, there's somebody here. We're not, we're not going to be left unguarded, as it were, if something happens. For 150 years, Britain's Navy had dominated the oceans of the world. But Dunkirk showed that her warships were vulnerable to air power. Then on the 17th of June, German bombers sank the troop ship Lancastria, killing 4,000 men. For the Royal Navy, it was the greatest single disaster of the war so far. The Prime Minister was shattered by the news. I had seen him suffused in grief at the loss, and he cried. And it takes a very great man, I think, to show his emotions. It was very endearing in a way. With warships on his mind, Churchill cabled President Roosevelt, pleading with him to send Britain 50 old American destroyers kept in storage by the US Navy. Mr. President, I must tell you that in the long history of the world, this is a thing to do now. But Roosevelt refused saying that Congress and public opinion would still not allow such direct intervention in a foreign war. Meanwhile, Roosevelt's generals carried out secret defense talks with the Canadian government, talks aimed at bringing the Royal Navy under joint U.S.-Canadian control the moment Britain fell. Many influential Americans were by now thinking of a future without an independent Britain. A top Nazi businessman threw a party at one of New York's finest hotels. Some of the most powerful figures in American industry attended, including executives from General Motors and Henry Ford's son, Edsel. The Nazis' guests were wined and dined and told to expect rich business opportunities in Hitler's new Europe. Convinced that Britain would fall at any moment, Whitelaw Reed hurried across the Atlantic to cover the story for his family's newspaper. I concluded that the invasion of Britain, which I thought was imminent, was going to be the biggest story since the birth of Christ, and I wanted to be in on it and help him. And I didn't get there for quite a while, so I was very relieved on arriving to find that England was still in one piece. Britain was not only in one piece. Reed soon found that some of its people had been infected with their prime minister's bravado. The customs official seemed uh, totally confident that all were to be well. And he said he had taken his daughter in hand and he had shown her how to fit a broom handle into the uh, end of a bottle. And then he broke off the big end of the bottle, and he said, if any bloody Nazi comes in my house, he's going to get that right in the face. <laughs> well, I thought it was unreal. I thought Britain didn't have the means to defend itself at that point, and they were in a kind of fool's paradise. 
I know at one point I was talking to a woman, she said she'd put a mattress on top of her tower so if she was going to be hit by a bomb, it would bounce off. <laughs> For Americans already living in Britain, war dominated every aspect of life. The spring was glorious. I remember having lunch in Chelsea with a dear friend of mine and talking about how beautiful the window boxes were. And I was carrying on about the fantastic colors. They were all so bright and garish and beautiful and, and heavenly and, and joyous. And he took me and said, come, I'll show you, show you another kind. And we walked around a corner, and there were two window boxes on a lovely little Chelsea house that had nothing but the darkest flowers, a kind of a black tulip and a very purple pants and just as dark as they could be. And he said, the woman who lives in this house, her husband, was killed uh, on an aircraft carrier that was sunk, and she said that her window boxes will always be in mourning for him. As London's parks replaced flower beds with barrage balloons, Ambassador Kennedy decided that it was time to send his family and much of his staff home to safety. Joe said at breakfast, he said, I'm going to send you home. And my feelings were absolutely torn because as much as I missed my family, I wanted to stay in England, desperately wanted to stay. A lot of the English uh, drivers were still they were in the garden, and they were talking, and they were wonderful cockney. And I heard one of the drivers say, Cor Blimey, the Uns have got to Paris. And I just burst into tears, you know. It, was an, it had to happen. I mean, you knew it was going to. But the, it just seemed like such a dreadful moment to think that the Germans were in Paris. Peter Vaux, now back home, found that despite the odds against Britain, his own family had been infected with some of Churchill's defiance. My father said to me, can you get me a pistol? And I did. And he was an, and he was an elderly man, of course, but, but they lived in Paynton. They were very close to the beach. He had a sort of feeling that if a German arrived on the beach, he could get one. And Churchill, remember, did say one of the, one of his speeches, you can always take one with you. And that would be exactly my father's attitude. He wanted that pistol, and I got him one. Peter Vox's regiment was ordered to the south coast to resist the expected invasion. His first job was to find places where tanks and their crews could be based. Most people were eager to help, but not all. In many cases, it was the people who got quite a lot to lose. Some of them would say, what's the good? Look what they've done in France. They, you won't, you lot, you won't hold them up. They'll be in here in no time. I don't want my house spoiled. But the thing that always, I always remember it was the little people, the farm laborers, the little farmer, and the people in the terraced houses who were so marvelous. They had so little to give, and they gave it so readily. Here are some factory workers who have organized their own defense corps and drill in their lunch hour. Britain's volunteer army had plenty of fighting spirit, but few modern weapons. I found that men were sitting up nights making fishing poles, and instead of a hook, they put a wad of gunpowder on it. And the idea was they would be hiding in holes every hundred yards or so. And when a tank came rumbling by, caught in the trap, they would cast the gunpowder on the top of the tank and explode it. And that is how primitive some of the defenses in England were at that time. The cables coming into Downing Street from Washington and Ottawa infuriated Churchill. North America's leaders seemed obsessed with what would happen to the Royal Navy once Britain lost the war. Churchill wanted them to help him win it, or at least to help him survive an anxious summer. But the military situation kept getting worse. Italy had declared war on Germany's side and France had just accepted humiliating peace terms. Churchill's latest fear was that Hitler would seize the powerful French Navy, thus threatening Britain's control of the English Channel and clearing a way for the invasion of Britain. It was a moment for decisive action. At the end of June, Churchill ordered his admirals to seize all French ships in British ports and he sent a powerful force to demand the surrender of the main French battle fleet in the North African port of Iran. Aboard the British battleship HMS Resolution was 18-year-old sailor Sam Patience. We didn't know until the actual sailing that we were 
going out to engage the French fleet who were trying to get to Brest or whatever, uh, German-occupied France. And uh, we were told the purpose was to go out and stop them from getting it. The French were given the option of neutralizing or scuttling their warships. Negotiations dragged on, but the result was deadlock. The British admirals were reluctant to open fire on men who had so recently been their allies, but Churchill insisted, ordering his navy to settle the matter quickly. We just opened fire on them. Noise shattering. <laughs> the, 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 the ship seemed to shake, you know. You get a full salvo of uh, eight 15-inch guns firing. That's a lot. And six-inch batteries as well, all out one side. The French warships, tied up at the docks and unable to maneuver, didn't stand a chance. Within minutes, over 1,300 French sailors were dead, and many more were wounded. Oh, there was a lot of damage done. The quayside was piled with bodies which we did with our shelling. You were never given, uh, you know, a sort of uh, question as to whether it was right or wrong. As far as you was concerned, you were just doing your job. The fleet had to be stopped from going over to the Germans. I didn't feel ashamed about doing it at all. It was a question of them or us. Within days, Churchill had put the better part of the French Navy beyond Hitler's reach. Some called it savage, treacherous even. But at a critical moment in the war, it swung the balance of naval power back Britain's way. When we heard this business of Iran, we felt it was an awful thing because we just thought, I remember thinking at the time we'd seen the French sailors with the red pom-poms on their white hats at Cherbourg when we first landed. It seemed an awful thing to be sinking their ships. But we did understand it, at least we did in the regiment, we understood that it was necessary. Churchill told Parliament that his action at Oran proved once and for all that his government would never make peace. And for the first time since becoming Prime Minister, he was acclaimed from all sides of the House of Commons. The attack on Iran had a profound impact in America, too. After weeks of humiliation for the British cause, here suddenly was proof that Britain still had teeth. One New York newspaper editor wrote, I'm for sending weapons to England, so long as it's run by a Churchill who will fight. President Roosevelt later said that Oran made him believe that the war in Europe might not end in 1940 after all. And from July, his policy to Britain took a much more positive line. Realizing that peace was now out of the question, Hitler launched a new offensive. In mid-July, he ordered the Luftwaffe to take control of the English Channel and close it to all British shipping. Every day, every hour, British convoys sail the seas, braving the perils of Nazi air raiders, and here comes a formation bent on challenging our supremacy on the sea. And it's a miss. I used to stand on the top of the Western Heights uh, and uh, watch the bombing of the convoys, and I waved my fist up in the air. The German bastards was the word I used. My old mum said, what did I hear you say, Frank? She said, I've never heard you swear before. She said, don't you ever say that again. I said, well, that's what everybody's calling them, mum. British fighter squadrons took to the air to protect the Channel convoys. The pilots were guided into battle by RAF ground controllers, assisted by young technicians from the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, like 20-year-old Edith Heap. They had furious battles over the convoys. We used to hear them on, on the uh, RT, and it was like, like a running commentary. We said, look out, there's somebody on your tail. We could hear all that. And, and uh, they'd say, oh, 
so-and-so's been shot down, you know, there's a plane going down, there's a parachute or there isn't one. So you knew exactly what was happening. And the girls in the radio cabins could actually say, oh, look out, there's something behind you, you know, do watch it. And, of course, they couldn't hear what they were saying because they weren't in actual contact with them. But it was very intense. And we also heard all the language that they... That they did, because you swear in battle. You know, the buggers and bloodies and... and, and four-letter words and all sorts of things, I mean, which, which you're going to say when you're being attacked, aren't you? And, and, and somebody got very uptight about girls hearing all this language. Well, we, we weren't concerned with that. A, we didn't know what it mean. B, we didn't care about that. We only cared about our pilots. A flotilla of destroyers steamed into view, patrolling the seas against possible invaders. Suddenly, a big flight of German dive bombers was reported. Patrolling RAF fighters hurtled to intercept them. In the battle which followed, nine Nazis were shot down. Really, I suppose it was one of the most exciting periods of my life to watch these dogfights. We could hear the screech of the German dive bombers in the channel, the explosions. It was flying at rooftop level. You could see the pilots sitting in them, the markings on the planes, hear the cannon shell blazing into one another. Sometimes they, they got stuck, they couldn't get out, you know, because of the, either the lid jammed, the cockpit cover jammed, or, or, or there was fire. Now, the fire it was the worst thing, because they got terribly burnt. And then that was when they used to scream, of course. The screaming was, was really, really terrible. And of course, an awful lot of them uh, went to hospital with these burns. Some of them pulled through and some didn't. In July, the RAF lost 110 fighters and shot down 140 German planes. Hitler's attempt to dominate the channel was being resisted, but only just. Whitelaw Reed traveled to Dover to cover the story for his newspaper and prepare for the expected invasion. Well, it was Hitler weather most of the time that summer, you know, and the skies were bright blue, and you would see the planes high in the sky. I'd been asked down for the weekend by Secretary of State for War Eden at the time, and I spent Saturday in their front yard with their children, shooting bows and arrows, and watching an occasional uh, fighter, German fighter, come streaking across the sky. So it was a nervous time, and as a result, a lot of people in Dover started living in the cliffs. I remember the bombing of the Grand Hotel because I was up the street a little ways and I heard things and uh, got myself in the doorway of a shop and there was a great thunderous clap, um, which must have been the bombs hitting the Grand Hotel, I guess, and everything shook around me. Uh, I hoped that uh, the building wouldn't collapse. <laughs> uh, when I came out, why? Uh, a lot of the glass looked like sort of new fallen snow in the street. And I went back to the hotel and one wing was in rubble. Many of the American reporters in Dover began to feel an affinity to the British people in this, their darkest hour. Witnessing the horrors of war firsthand led Whitelaw Reed to conclude that American neutrality must end. The next day, I was going out to Shakespeare Cliff to see some of the dogfights overhead, and all of a sudden there was a terrible screech. We 
went out to explore the beach, and one of the things I found on the beach was uh, an old man who had been too close to a blast, and he'd been decapitated. His head was lying close by, and his dog lay by his side. And uh, it was uh, a sad bit of evidence of the damage that was being done. It seemed that the world was on fire and that we ought to do something about it. That Hitler was an evil that had to be eliminated somehow. So progressively, I came to that kind of thinking myself. American writer Ben Robertson, one of Whitelaw Reed's colleagues on the Dover Cliffs, later wrote about his feelings at this moment. Those were wonderful days in every way. I lost my sense of personal fear because I saw that what happened to me did not matter. We counted as individuals only as we took our place in the procession of history. It was not we who counted. It was what we stood for. And I knew now for what I was standing. I was for freedom. I realized that good can often come from death. I understood Valley Forge and Gettysburg at Dover. Reports from England began to turn American opinion. Pressure mounted to send substantial aid. But time was running out. From just across the channel, the Germans were planning the biggest air attack in history. The young fighter pilots of the Royal Air Force would soon be tested as never before. The Battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we can stand up to him, all Europe may be freed and the life of the world may move forward into broad, sunlit upland. Finest Hour, The Battle of Britain, was made possible by contributions to your PBS stations from viewers like you. Thank you.